And now, our feature presentation. Hey kids, Dad here. Now, first off, there's nothing to worry about. We're not doing a format change here, and I didn't sit you down to have a serious chat, but I did think that for the topic of the video at hand, and you've already read the title of the video, so you probably have a bunch of questions, I felt that we needed to have a little bit more of a heart-to-heart -heart this time around than me just hiding behind my digital avatar as I normally do. Uh, so, the questions going through your head right now. Does Dad hate Wrath? Uh, does he think it's a terrible game? Uh, if he's comparing it to Daikatana, which is a terrible game, does that mean that Wrath is full of terrible bugs and bad AI? See, this is why we're sitting down face-to-face -face at the start of the video today. Um, because no, I don't hate Wrath. I don't think it's a terrible game, and no, there aren't any major bugs or glitches or bad AI that I've been able to find during my playthrough. I also don't think that Daikatana is a terrible game either, so uh, let's just all dispel all of these notions right out of the gate. See, the reason that I'm asking if Wrath is the modern Daikatana is because these two games have a lot of development similarities. Both of them were born of a singular vision of a solo dev working with the Quake engine. Both of them went through several team changes during development, and both of them were stuck in what can only be to call what can only be to called what can only be called development hell for literally years. And while I do enjoy Wrath, and I do enjoy Daikatana, both of them are definitely flawed games that prevent either of them from being truly great. I wanted to be upfront with this part of the video and not slowly circle around to the point this time around because I really want you kids to understand that I genuinely believe Wrath as a game is something unique and special and should be experienced by fans of the FPS genre, just like Daikatana. But every game has a history, and not all of those histories are exactly sunshine and rainbows. Some of them are filled with headaches and heartbreak on the road to going gold, and if there's any first-person shooter that can compare to the fraught development of Daikatana, I believe that it is this one. So as we dive into both the development history and the game experience itself, I'd like you all to just keep that in mind. And now, with all of that out of the way, let's examine the latest game from 3D Realms, Fulcrum Publishing, Killpixel, and Slipgate Ironworks, Wrath, Eon of Ruin. In the beginning, there was Ion Fury. Released into early access on February 28th, 2018, Ion Fury was a throwback shooter built entirely using a source port of the build engine, specifically eDuke32. Developed by Voidpoint and published by 3D Realms, Ion Fury was hailed as a part of the holy trinity of retro shooters that repopularized and revitalized the genre. After this initial success, 3D Realms began searching for a new title to add to the growing retro shooter renaissance. Frederick Schrieber, who was vice president of 3DR in 2018, and is now their current CEO, specifically began digging through Quake 1 modding forums to see if there was any hidden talent to bring into the spotlight. In an interview with Variety Magazine in 2019, Schrieber said that after bringing the build engine back into the spotlight, it only made sense for their next retro title to utilize another long dormant game engine, the Quake 1 engine, also known as id Tech 2. And here, while digging through the forums, 3D Realms stumbled across the portfolio of Jeremiah Killpixel Fox, 
and they were blown away by what they saw. Fox had been slowly developing a mod for Quake over the previous five years, something so awe-inspiring that 3D Realms contacted Fox and offered to bankroll a budget to finish development, and then even publish the title. A little further back, in 2013, Fox had come up with the concept for what would become Wrath, Eon of Ruin. It was a vision that was so solid in his mind that he knew he had to throw everything he could into developing it. So, he quit his job, moved to the Florida Keys, and was even living out of his car for a time while putting this together. In order to get some insight into the game's development, I reached out to Fox through Discord, and he was gracious enough to answer a few questions that I had. He even provided a few screenshots of what Wrath looked like super early in development. For starters, I asked him if Wrath had always had a dark fantasy aesthetic when he'd first conceived the game. Although always dark and moody, Wrath was initially sci-fi. It also had a fairly complex narrative for a retro FPS. After some tests, I ended up scrapping the sci-fi direction and going fantasy primarily due to art and design considerations. Sci-fi is such a widely used aesthetic, and at the time I didn't think I could employ it in such a way that it would stand out from the crowd. Also, my game art skills were in their infancy. In fact, my first texture was a sci-fi tech panel. My art, at a technical level, was very sloppy and unrefined, and I felt that a more organic aesthetic, stone, dirt, vegetation, etc., would suffer less from this. Simply put, I thought fantasy was more versatile from a visual design perspective, in addition to being more technically forgiving. In the same Variety article from 2019, Fox was quoted as saying that he wanted Wrath to have an authentic 90s shooter experience, something that he didn't feel other retro shooters at the time were truly capturing, saying that they tended to feel more like caricatures. He specifically cited Doom, Quake, and Hexen as influences for Wrath, but I asked him if there were any games that he had been specifically playing during development, which may have also had an impact on the final product. As far as the mechanical feel is concerned, Wrath is most informed by Doom 2 and Quake. Tonally, I look to Hexen, Blood, Doom 3, etc. in addition to Quake. Games such as Riven and Morrowind also influenced me in that I wanted to make Wrath feel more alien, otherworldly, and mysterious. The goal was to avoid using real-world references as much as possible. The old world isn't Earth and doesn't share our history. Fortunately, it does have a break-action double-barreled shotgun. One thing that I want to note real quick here is that while id Tech 2 was the basis for Wrath's development, the game was actually built using a source port of the Quake engine called Dark Places. Now, source port or not, creating a modern first-person shooter on older technology must have created some headaches, so I asked Fox if there were any specific limitations he found himself working against while creating Wrath. My mindset was never to work against the limitations, but to work with them, and in doing so tap into a certain mode of creativity and problem solving that would produce the genuine feel of a classic FPS. I would say the primary limitation that I failed to really work with and ended up working against was AI navigation. Quake's navigation and collision halls are very simple. Enemies are basically axially aligned rectangles, a square bounding box that can't rotate, and they move in a given direction and only change that direction if they see a player or hit a wall. This works well enough in geometrically simple maps like Quake, where the floor is a flat plane and there are few obstacles aside from flat walls. Wrath, on the other hand, has giant maps full of terrain and props. Quake's navigation simply doesn't work with this, so we had to use a different system employing various other methods, including a node graph. 
even with this, enemies still get stuck on things and bumble around. It's worth noting that it's unlikely this issue would have occurred with the sci-fi aesthetic, which is inherently artificial and lends itself well to simple, traversable geometry. This simple geometry was the plan, initially, and even documented in various guides for the level designers, but over time, the inclination to make organics geometrically complex crept in, and we pivoted to the extensive use of terrain. This also led to player movement feeling slippery and imprecise. Another hurdle was the map format and level design workflow, especially for level designers who were unfamiliar with it and only had experience with Quake 1 BSP. We used a modern Quake 3 BSP format that, while robust and feature-rich, required much more work and effort to properly leverage. Quake 1 BSP is, by comparison, far more forgiving and easy to use, so there were some growing pains. Growing pains is probably, and unfortunately, the most fitting descriptor for much of Wrath's development. Wrath was formally announced on March 7th, 2019, and released into Early Access November 22nd of the same year. The promise at the time was that Wrath would see a 1.0 release by November 2020, and going by the initial roadmap of the game, it looked to be a fairly dependable promise. Originally launching with a hub world and two maps, the game looked to launch with five full maps, 12 enemies, six weapons, and a multiplayer mode of full release. However, as content updates slipped, and as 2020 sped by, it became evident that Wrath wasn't going to meet its milestones. On December 21st, 2020, Wrath's 1.0 release was pushed back to 2021. Then, on August 23rd, 2021, full release was again pushed back to 2022. Now, during this time, the Steam page for Wrath was mostly silent as far as updates were concerned, with sparse information sporadically dropping here and there. However, with the announcement that full release was being pushed back to 2022, 3D Realms began publishing bi-weekly updates from the devs to keep fans drip-fed with content information and behind-the-scenes peaks, including a new roadmap which clearly showed that the scope of the game had increased, with three hubs now promised instead of just one, and even more content than originally promised. When looking at the 2019 Variety article, in which it was stated that Wrath was going to take around seven hours to complete, and the original roadmap for Wrath's early access, it's clear that the game initially was much smaller than what we would end up getting, and that the scope increased somewhere between 2019 and 2021. I asked Fox about the original intent for the game's size, and if he could tell me what specifically had been added during this time. Prior to partnering with 3D Realms, Wrath had conceptually been a very large game, about as large as the one that shipped. It had hubs, artifacts, a journal, and a more complex story with a cast of seven characters. I recognized it was unnecessarily overscoped, and I was biting off more than I could chew. I ended up trimming it way down a month or two before talks with 3D Realms began. What I had during those talks was a very streamlined, traditional FPS with a linear series of smallish levels, 8 weapons, 12 to 15 enemies, 1 boss, and possibly 2 mini-bosses. Sometime into development, maybe 6 to 12 months, I was asked to consider new content or reconsider the cut stuff in a desire to make the game bigger and better. The hub system, bosses, and a journal to track progress were added. For various other reasons, levels also became much, much larger, which had an overall negative effect on progression, pacing, combat encounters, and the save system, which was designed for much smaller levels. Continuing forward with updates via Steam, the game's release date slipped again and again, first with a promise of spring 2023, and then eventually a vague coming soon shortly after that. Bi-weekly updates continued to come fast and furious, until, at last, on September 30th, 2023, Wrath was given a firm release date of February 27th, 2024, a date which the game stuck to and finally made its bow. Now, I did not play Wrath in Early Access. I was gifted the game by one of my brothers sometime back in 2019, and I wanted to play it, but I always told myself I would do so once it hit full release. Back in 2019, Early Access wasn't something that I gave much weight to, a viewpoint that I have since reconsidered. So when Wrath hit 1.0 on February 27th, I got up early, I booted up the game, and I caught my breath in awe of a brand new game made with love and care on the Quake engine. Of course, there was one question lingering over release that everyone was asking as they booted up the game for the first time. After all of this time, is Wrath going to be any good? I could certainly tell you kids that no matter how you land on this side of the debate, one thing's for sure. Wrath makes a hell of a first impression. For starters, check out this main menu. 
Just wow. From the start, Wrath is letting us know that this game is not fucking around. Jeremiah Fox's authentic 90s aesthetic is already shining through with the static, detailed pixel art background, the minimalistic menu selections, and Andrew Hulschult's gorgeously haunting music. Hulschult, with this soundtrack, has largely eschewed the more bombastic work he's produced for such games as Nightmare Reaper and Proteus, and instead produces a largely atmospheric, shivering soundtrack that reminds me of a mid-evil's quieter moments. Wrath's OST is much more contemplative, hesitant, reflective of a Lovecraftian perspective gazing upon a dead world gone mad. Here and there, the music will rise up and challenge the player, but for the most part, Hulschult is comfortable taking a back seat to the visual splendor in front of us, enhancing the mood with shadowy atmosphere. Here in the menu, just in this briefest of glimpses, with the dilapidated environment and the score, we're getting a brilliant snapshot of the atmosphere that Wrath seeks to encompass. There's only three difficulties to choose from at this point, easy, medium, and hard. And I'm going to choose medium. I will later regret this decision. Starting up the game, we're treated to a brief in-engine cutscene featuring a coffin on a boat drifting towards a shoreline. And once the boat lands, the coffin opens, and we're in control of the game. We are the Outlander, a, uh person from out outside these lands and this is the shepherd who welcomes us to the isle of the dead ominous thus begins wrath's tutorial which delivers unto us the basics movement mechanics such as running jumping ledge grabbing and air dashing more on that in a second save mechanics which come in the form of shrines or soul tethers Shrines are scattered throughout the game sporadically, and when you enter them, they will immediately save your progress and also top up your health to maximum. It's a one-use deal, though, so there will be times when you see a shrine that you might not want to cross right away, because the health boost it provides can be a much-needed boon. The second save mechanic comes in the form of soul tethers. These bad boys are consumable save points, and... Thankfully, there's quite a few of them to find and collect here. I tried to keep around 8 or 9 at any given point, but as the game got spicier in later levels, I was pressed to just hold on to only 2 or 3 at a time. Wrath can and will be a brutal, brutal experience, and choosing when and where to use a soul tether is a strategy in and of itself. I was immediately reminded of Daikatana's save gems, in a good way, and while there is an option in the menu to use infinite saves versus consumable saves, the game is based around the idea that you are unsafe at every single turn. 
One thing that I want to make sure I point out here is that Wrath gives you the option of loading one of multiple save points, either an autosave, which is usually at the start of a level, a soul tether, or a shrine. So while you might have dropped a tether near a super sweaty situation at low health and low ammo, you could instead choose to load your shrine save, which definitely has more health and probably more ammo, but the question at that point is this. How far back was the shrine, and are you willing to make up all of that lost ground? The answer is... Uh, probably not, but at least it's an option. And finally, we also get introduced to our combat mechanics. Here in the tutorial, we receive our first weapon, the Blade of Ruination. I cannot fucking stress enough. The Blade of Ruination is quite possibly the single greatest melee weapon in a first-person shooter ever. I am not joking. This thing slices and dices and fucks shit up faster than I can put together a montage. <laughs> Now, the thing with the Blade of Ruination is that it's kind of a double-edged sword. <laughs> the primary attack is... fine. Really nothing to write home about, something to use only in emergencies or in the case of needing to save ammo. It does the job well enough, like any FPS melee weapon. But the secondary attack is where it really sets itself apart. Every weapon in Wrath has both a primary attack and a secondary attack, and for the Blade of Ruination, it is a charge-up thrust that will launch the Outlander forward through the air in whatever direction he's pointing. This air dash attack is going to be your bread and butter for making outrageous leaps across large spaces, or to reek narrow ledges that carry extra items for our inventory. The inventory is the other aspect of combat mechanics that we are introduced to, and make no mistake, this is going to be a huge fucking part of combat for you to work with. Wrath's world is littered with artifacts, like the Flask of Rage, which is the first one we get to pick up. It's basically a quad damage, and comes in real handy when you're outnumbered 5 to 1. Or the Life Siphon, which drains health from enemies when you kill them. And it comes in real handy when you're outnumbered 5 to 1. There's also a shield, an invulnerability item, a turret, a rebreather for prolonged submersion, and my personal favorite, the Void Grenade, which creates a small black hole that sucks in enemies before exploding. <laughs> Absolutely smashing. Most of these items are pretty handy at any given point in time, except for the Confounding Atar, a purple mist that will temporarily turn enemies against each other. Out of everything in my inventory, this was the one I just never seemed to use because everything else had a more immediate advantage. One thing to note is that you can't use multiple artifacts at the same time. Most of them operate on a timer, so when you use one, you'll be frantically looking down here at your HUD for how long the effect is going to last before you can use another. At this point in the game, we'll also have been introduced to two enemies. The Fallen, which are pretty much Quake zombies that move faster, and the Widows, which... <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ! The Widows are easily, handily, the sweatiest enemies in the game. Okay, maybe second sweatiest, but I swear to shit, these things are placed around corners, behind collapsible walls, directly behind doors that you, the player, are about to open, and are basically walking, screaming, jack-in-the-box jump scares that close the distance between you and them far too quickly for my own personal liking. And once they get up in your face, they slash at you so fast that you can go from full health to half health to dead in a goddamn second if you're not paying attention to your surroundings. Taking them out quickly is the only strategy. The only strategy. So choose your weapons wisely in the heat of the moment, because if you get stuck with an empty weapon or caught on a corner while trying to back away from them, it's gonna be game over real fast. Once we've exited the tutorial area, the Shepherd greets us with one last little bit of info. In order to travel to different realms here in Wrath, we're going to need to collect relics. Each map is going to have a relic at the end of it, and here, we're going to pick up the Relic of the Isle of the Dead, then place it in this standing stone over here, and that will open the portal to the first of three hubs that we will be visiting on this otherworldly journey, Morning Vale. Something that I just want to say about this tutorial real quick is that it is lean, clean, and has zero fat on it. We're in, we're out, we know what we're doing with minimal hand-holding. The short length of the journey also makes it easy to pop in and whip through it quickly if you're starting Wrath for a second playthrough. While I would prefer there to be an option to skip a tutorial if you've already been through it once before, the brevity of this one makes up for the inability to skip past. 
Another win here is that the tutorial is handily doing double duty by engaging us with what to expect from the atmosphere of the world, breathing an extra ounce of life into the game as we arrive. Rather than most tutorials that I've run through in my gaming time, this experience here with Wrath really promotes the notion that we, the gamer, not just the outlander, but the gamer themselves are stepping into a world, not just a game. The visuals, the mechanics, the atmosphere dripping everywhere firmly sells the fact that this, this really isn't Kansas, Toto. And once we step into Morningvale, boy, oh boy, are we transported away to another world. I very clearly remember entering Morningvale. This world, the first of three that we'll be visiting in Wrath, is a cold, bitter, dilapidated place. Here we're going to find five distinct areas that we are going to explore. The Undercrofts, the Mire, the Hallow, the Gardens, and the Priory. We've got gothic architecture, swamps and arboretum, winding underground passages, a graveyard full of snow, molten lava, a cathedral, a color scheme of grays, whites, and accents of crimson. Very Hexen inspired, and yet, at the same time, unlike anything I've personally seen or felt in a first person shooter. So when I first entered Morningvale and saw the sheer scope of just the hub world, I thought, no, no, there's no way, there's no way it's actually this big, and yet it really is. You can wander around the hub, find secrets, find artifacts and soul tethers, and as you meander about, you'll discover the locations of the five portals that will take us to the five aforementioned levels. We'll also be introduced to our journal, which pops up whenever we press tab and provides minimalistic descriptions of enemies and weapons when we encounter them. Rather than a text-based entry, it's just a sketch, which I thought was really neat and organic. Here and there throughout the game, we'll also find scrolls of narrative, which can be read in the journal. These aren't necessary to understanding the plot of the game, they really serve mostly as just flavor text, but they do add some really interesting vibes to the goings on. At first, I was completely overwhelmed. I was just kind of running around like, uh, where are things? Which portal am I supposed to go in first? Is there an order? Should there be an order? But this wide open design actually gave me the space to take it all in before taking my first steps into combat here. In lesser hands, a hub of this size with multiple portals placed in areas that aren't necessarily within the player's line of sight would become a confusing exercise in navigation, but no, no, these are not lesser hands. Okay, so you kids remember the standing stones that we just saw on the Isle of the Dead, where we are going to place the relics that we collect? Well, here in Morningvale, the standing stones are all facing toward each level that they represent. A brilliant, brilliant piece of environmental navigation that acts as a compass, pointing you in the direction you need to go if you're not sure which direction you need to travel. Let's say that you've completed two out of five maps, and you've placed the relics in their corresponding standing stones but you're not sure which direction to head next. Okay then, pick an empty standing stone, walk in the direction that it's facing, and voila! Soon, you are arrived at the portal you desire, and man oh man, does that make meandering the hub of Morningvale feel liberating. I mean, kids, don't get me wrong, I love a little exploration without hand-holding, but I have to admit, my secret shame is that I get lost easily in video games. No joke, I've played Silent Hill 2 so many times that I ought to know it like the back of my hand, but I can't go five minutes without checking the map to see where I am or where I'm going. Doom, Marathon, any FPS game with an auto map, same thing. I'm constantly checking the map to figure out my place, regardless of how well done the signposts and landmarks are. So to have this here, this wonderful, simple, brilliant little design element that makes it so I know exactly where to go, even when I'm lost, beautiful. Excellent. 10 out of 10. Fucking love this. Okay, another wild design piece here that is actually driving me bonkers just thinking about it is the scaling nature of the difficulty depending on the order you go through the maps. Just a second ago, I was talking about how the openness of the hub had me confused as to which portal I needed to go through first. Do you need to go through these in a specific order? <laughs> well, that's another beautiful thing about Wrath's design. You don't. See, no matter which portal you go through, each level of Morningvale is going to scale itself to where you are at in the game. Whichever portal you choose to enter first, the game will treat that level like it is the first level of the game, introducing you to each of the weapons and slowly rolling out the rogues gallery of enemies that will be facing down throughout the course of this odyssey. Which is just fucking absurd. 
Each level has a different set of enemy placements depending on the difficulty we select at the beginning of the adventure, as well as the order of portals that we choose moving forward. We're also going to be picking up the first six out of nine weapons that the game has to offer, so each of these levels have to have placements for us to pick up each weapon, as though we're picking it up for the very first time, no matter which map we've chosen first, and... <laughs> No wonder this game went through development hell. On one hand, this methodology is cool as hell. Walk into any map in any order and no matter how you run the game, the game will be tracking itself right beside you, slowly amping up the pressure so that you're never too off balance, and you get access to all the weapons you need right away. I'm, unless I'm mistaken, and I, I really don't think I am, you're gonna have all six of those weapons by the end of the first map you play. God! And yet, on the other hand, the sheer amount of overthinking within this method of design is brutal. I don't do math real good. My 12-year-old does. But just thinking about how there's four difficulties. Yeah, there's a there's an unlockable fourth difficulty which opens up after you beat the game for the first time. Four difficulties and five maps per hub. So let's just say that each map gets built and then populated with enemies and weapon placements four times each. However, we then have to take into account which order the map is being played which means that the difficulty scaling has to be tied into that, so then each map is going to be populated another five times on top of that. Four times five, and this is being generous, four times five is 20 separate times each level is being populated, then tested, then adjusted, then tested again. That is, at best, 100 passes total per hub. The amount of fine-tuning utilizing this method is surgically insane. I'm genuinely unsure whether or not this design is a boon or a burden to the game. Obviously, diving in, being able to pick any order of the maps that I want to experience, truly reinvigorating the replay value through the roof, it's kind of awe-inspiring at how genius the method is in execution. But then again, the sheer amount of work involved with all of this in the background just to craft it... it ah. I don't know, kids. Morning Vale as a hub is a part of the game that sees the lion's share of this work. The rest of the game doesn't have to focus on so many weapons or enemy introductions, so there's less burden on the game to populate in that regard. What I will say is that Morning Vale does not suffer from overdesign, and as it stands, is one of the tightest, most thrilling FPS experiences I have ever had, and part of that comes from the weaponry. Here in Morning Vale, we get the revolver, the shotgun, the Fang Spitter, the Retcher, and the Slag Cannon. The Revolver might seem like a puny little pea shooter at first, but the semi-hit-scan nature of its primary attack, coupled with high accuracy even at long distance, makes this the go-to gun for picking off monsters at long range, even sometimes the mid to high tier enemies. Every weapon in the game has a secondary attack, as we've already mentioned, and the Revolver, which has three spinning chambers, fires all three barrels at once that will ricochet off of surfaces if you happen to miss your target. I didn't really use this attack very often in the game, because it oddly felt like it just drained precious ammo more than it did damage. And when I say precious ammo, I mean it. This game's ammunition economy is somewhat tight-fisted, despite some enemies dropping specific ammo packs when they die. The revolver, and our next weapon, the shotgun, both became my workhorses through 75% of the game, simply because their damage to ammo consumption ratio is probably the most useful out of all the weapons we will find. There are two exceptions, which we'll have to discuss later though, because they don't show up in Morning Vale. Meanwhile, the shotgun is... <laughs> this this thing absolutely fucks. You kids know that dad loves his shotguns in his FPS games, and this one immediately enters the god tier list. Big boom, high damage output, fast reload, and the secondary attack? Alright, so check this out. The secondary charges up a high-powered attack that shoots outward in two condensed blasts. Then, after it strikes its target, the blasts disperse, creating a small explosion on contact and ricocheting the condensed pellets everywhere else. It's a heavy attack that only consumes two shells, the same amount of ammo a regular shotgun blast uses, with the only downside being an awkward charge-up timer that it couldn't quite seem to get down throughout the game, but if you stick with it, then the secondary attack will save your ass in moments of panic. The Fang Spitter is, for lack of a better comparison, the nail gun of the game. <laughs> And I love using it. It's a damn shame that the gun doesn't feel like it actually does as much damage as you think it would, though. And, on top of that, it only carries 150 rounds at any given time. Primary fire is a rapid, 
fairly accurate stream of fangs. Yes, fangs. The fang spitter does actually shoot teeth. <laughs> isn't, <laughs> isn't that fucking cool? And the secondary fire is a spray and pray attack, which fires twice as fast at the cost of wild inaccuracy. Best only used in situations where you're either up close and personal, or your target is so large you absolutely cannot miss. And while this seems like a great option for when you need to carve a path through a phalanx of monsters charging towards you, Somehow the secondary attack feels like it does even less damage than the primary fire does. This gun, in concept and execution, is really fucking cool. I love how it's constantly covered in blood, how the twin barrels look like boars meant for drilling through flesh, how you can see the teeth in the chamber, freshly extracted from dead foes. One of the few saving graces here with this weapon is that there are two enemies, the Widow and the Heretic, that drop fangs after dying, so you often have a high chance of replenishing ammo for it. And yet, it just expends ammo too damn fast with too little benefit. Sure, I found it worked really well from afar on low tier enemies when I needed to clear things out quicker than the revolver would, but since I couldn't carry more than 150 rounds on my ammo belt, it never felt truly reliable. The Wretcher, though, is the unsung hero of Wrath. This sucker launches cysts, which are green sacks of acid that explode on contact. Enemies use them too, and they can and will vomit them in your direction. The Wretcher is our de facto grenade launcher. The cyst will either explode on contact with an enemy or stick to whatever benign surface they hit. If they land harmlessly, they'll act as landmines, waiting for a monster to come into contact with them and explode. This can be really versatile if you want to set up traps in smaller spaces for enemies to get baited into. The secondary fire launches three quick cysts in a row, smaller ones that don't do quite as much damage as the primary fire, and while these also explode on contact with an enemy, they will bounce about the environment if they miss. I honestly forgot about the Wretcher too many times while playing, partially due to other weapons being more accurate in close-range combat, but also because the splash damage from the cysts is pretty harsh, so using this on an enemy right in front of you is not a good idea. However, the cysts will one-shot most low-tier enemies, so you can potentially clear an entire fucking room with this thing, then switch back to the shotgun and continue about your day as though nothing happened. Finally, we have the slag cannon, which just... It's trying, it's really trying, but it just doesn't have the heft or the damage output to feel really useful. And you would think that a lava cannon would be able to fuck some shit up, right? Rapid fire projectiles are the primary fire, which are somehow really inaccurate and difficult to lead shots with, and the secondary fire is one big massive explosive shot that costs five rep- fi Five rounds?! This is another weapon you don't see a lot of ammo for, so five rounds for a- <laughs> Five rounds is a- fucking lot for just one blast, and that blast doesn't nearly do enough damage. No, not for what these enemies can absorb, which is really the elephant in the room here. On paper, all of these weapons are not only competent, but will see you through the day easily. In execution, however, it feels like you're just dumping ammunition into any enemy that is higher than low tier. Low tier enemies are basically anything that are humanoid in appearance. Anything that actually looks monstrous should be immediately considered mid to high tier. All of them do high damage output, all of them absorb tremendous amounts of damage before going down, and they're more than likely going to attack you in large groups that will thoroughly drain your resources if you are not copiously using artifacts to either boost your own damage or absorb health from fallen enemies. I mean, just look at this enemy, the heretic. Those of you who've already played Wrath will feel a little tingle of terror in your taint just from that little montage. Those of you who haven't played this game are lucky because facing down the heretics are spicy endeavors at best, frustrating deaths at worst. Earlier, when I said the Widows were probably the second sweatiest enemies to face down, yeah, the heretics are probably the first. 
Heretics are the best example of how unfair it feels to fight monsters in Wrath. They make their announcement. They vomit fireballs in your direction as they get closer. And once they've gotten within a certain proximity, they charge at you while screaming and proceed to literally bite your head off. You can, and oftentimes will, stand there dumping round after round into them, depending on your current state of ammunition, hoping and praying that you have enough fangs or that your secondary shotgun blast won't miss, circle strafing like crazy to get out of their path, backing away frantically, and still they'll come, sometimes in groups of three or four, growling and screaming and advancing in your position unless you take them down quickly. This is the state of most of the enemies in Wrath. Big, ugly, dangerous motherfuckers who refuse to stop firing for a second, absolutely tanking 90% of the damage that your weapons deliver until they finally fall, and you now have to turn and start shooting at another damaged sponge of a monster who's already been firing at you for the last 30 seconds. And our little buddy, the Outlander, he's no tank himself. There's a reason we have all of these artifacts at our disposal, because he's actually quite the squishy little guy who needs all the help he can to stay alive lifeblood vials armor dark armor although i genuinely don't understand what dark armor did i think it added like a secondary layer of armor so it is just double stacked but i never really understood what it did if that isn't the case it's going to take a judicious use of artifacts to keep our boy alive and you're going to die a lot <laughs> A lot! Dumping ammo into enemies like it's the ice bucket challenge and seeing little results can be sometimes frustrating, sometimes outright damning if you're not staying on top of things. But here is where Wrath genuinely provides something very clever that I did not expect. What if I told you that our very first weapon is actually the strongest weapon in the game? There's one that's potentially stronger, but we'll get to that one. The Blade of Ruination isn't just a wrist-mounted daikatana useful for air dashing and dodging. No. What if I told you that a fully charged secondary attack from the Blade of Ruination will one-shot most enemies in the game? That it will two-shot the highest tier non-boss enemies in the game? This is a hidden gem. This, of course, took some experimentation. Of course I didn't want to get within melee distance of half of these enemies. Not only are they clawing away at me, but roughly a third of them will explode when they die. So if you're standing right there when they do, then you're taking that damage. But one time, I had my Cruel Aegis activated. That's the invulnerability artifact, by the way. And I figured I'd go to town with the Blade of Ruination. After all, I saw an achievement for killing 100 enemies with the blade, and I wanted to get it. Imagine my surprise when I realized how powerful that secondary strike is. Heretics, oppressors, even the fucking executioners. The executioners are like pyramid head shamblers. Fast tank enemies with two blades that move fast and can kill you in one or two hits. But if you can charge up your blade and get in position first, you can one hit those fuckers. Or two hit if you only land a glancing blow. Sometimes you'll rip off one of their arms and have to go back in for more surgery. But still, still, this revelation was everything to me. Wrath operates on a risk versus reward ammo economy. Sure, you can pump fangs into everything in front of you and see how far you get. You can also swap to the Blade of Ruination to get in a one-shot kill on a heretic, swap back to your shotgun, and keep moving. Despite the number of enemies that cause splash damage on death, you can consider that damage intake the ammo cost of a one-hit kill on an enemy that would otherwise be withdrawing a hell of a lot more from your HP otherwise. So, there is definitely a system and a strategy at work here. Unfortunately, what still ends up happening here is that some of these weapons feel terrifically underpowered in the face of so many monsters bearing down on you all at once, especially when so many of them require so much ammo to put down. And unless you're in invincible mode, you can't just use the Blade of Ruination on all of them. To this extent, Wrath can and will sometimes feel unfairly tough. Difficulty is a big problem here at times. Playing on medium, which I said I would regret, and boy oh boy did I. Just on medium, there were so many moments where I was just 
overwhelmed with the number of monsters on screen and in my face. Trying to run past them can accidentally trigger new enemies to spawn once you cross trigger plates, meaning you could unintentionally unleash the hordes of hell in a matter of seconds if you don't carefully pace your combat. Despite the pedigree of the engine and the talent behind the scenes, this is not a run and gun retro shooter. Trying to play this spray and pray style will result in too much ammo lost, too much health lost, and eventually too much progress lost. Wrath struggles at times to walk that fine line between blistering power fantasy and punishing combat, and as the game progresses, that sensation only deepens. Look, I like Wrath. I like the controls, I like the feel of the weapons, I like the enemies, and I really, really like these graphics. The Quake engine has never ever looked better than it does here. But Wrath is a game that stretches itself out far too thin to feel satisfying by the end of it. These levels are huge. I mean like, fucking huge. In Morning Vale, I didn't feel the stress of these gigantic maps. I was taken in, drawn to my screen, engulfed, blissed out, thoroughly and 100% on the edge of my seat in awe of how tight, how visceral, how deftly laid out these maps are. I mentioned earlier that I get lost a lot in FPS games, you know? But I couldn't help but marvel at how Wrath layers pathways, sometimes moving back and forth organically from point A to point B and then circling back around. There are, at times, hubs within these hub worlds, like in the gardens, where the central area connects to all three colored doors that we need keys for, moving back and forth, and each time we return to the central area, new enemies have spawned, renewing our interest and keeping our tension high. The first map that I chose to play in Morning Vale, the Priory, is probably the best example of how good the level design is here. We begin outside, on a snowy pathway near a frozen lake which we can dive into and explore, but what we really want to do is take the path through the caverns to the outside of the Priory itself. Now we can see through the gate the red door of the chapel that is our ultimate destination, but it's going to take some time before we get there. We're going to have to find a way around the outer gates, which involves swimming through the icy waters below and surrounding the Priory. We make our way through an underground sanctum, pop out inside the gated area, investigate several of the buildings of the Priory searching for keys and items, unlocking shortcuts all the way before we finally unlock the chapel and commence with a massive arena fight. Of course, once the chapel fight is done, we're still not done because then we have to work our way underground once more into a sprawling cave filled with molten lava and temporary power-ups that allow us to fly. Wrath has what I call power-up gates, because they look like gates and there's one unique gate per hub world. Here, this one allows us to fly, but whenever we're using whatever power the gates imbue, we also can't use any of our own artifacts at the same time, so be careful. Anyways, we have to make our way up, down, and through the lava caves in search of the Priory Relic, and once we've found that, we have one last fight to carve our way through before the portal back to Morning Vale opens up and we're at last allowed to leave. Now, describing all of this in such a truncated manner feels like a huge disservice to how enveloping this experience really is. It took me over an hour and a half to finally complete this first map. An hour and a half. Understanding it the way I do now, I could definitely shave off quite a bit of that time, but I need you kids to understand that an hour and a half to complete one map in Wrath is not outside the realm of possibility. These maps are fucking huge, and at times, I certainly felt the weight of how large they are. When you consider the difficulty, how squishy the Outlander is, and how tanky the enemies are, and then factor in the save system, Wrath can, at times, feel like running a fucking marathon with every single map. Part of the stress that I felt while playing this was in trying to conserve my soul tethers. I knew I had a limited amount, so I was constantly searching for more and trying desperately to only use them when necessary. Unfortunately, if you're not using them a little bit more liberally, you could find yourself dying at a point where the incoming enemies are plentiful, trying to struggle through large combat encounters over and over, or simply having to replay 5-10 to 10 minutes worth of exploration that you've already done over and over and over, if you're not utilizing your soul tethers properly, I found myself begging the game, please, let me get through this. Please, let me get to a point where I can use a soul tether. Please, 
let me through. Please don't kill me again. I said back in the Isle of the Dead chapter that I recommend using the Soul Tether save system instead of the infinite save option in order to better experience what the developer intended for this game. Fuck that! I retract that statement and instead insist that you use infinite saves. These maps are too goddamn big at times. It can and will be so much easier, so much gentler, and so much less stressful to simply have the option to save whenever you want. You'll still be able to use shrines in addition to the infinite saves, so you genuinely have nothing to lose. And listen, if you really want that hardcore experience, there's nothing wrong with the Soul Tether route. I like them, I like the concept, I like that we mostly have access to a lot of them, and I'm glad that's how I played through the game the first time around. I've already started a second playthrough of the game using infinite saves, and kids, I promise that's the way to go. Think of using Soul Tethers as an upgraded difficulty setting. Medium difficulty with infinite saves is a lot different from medium difficulty with Soul Tethers. So, okay, Morning Veil. To sum it all up, as a fantastic FPS experience. I could see here what Fox was going for with the phrase authentic 90s FPS, and it solidly delivers. Map design, game feel, combat, all of it is fluid, tight, and despite some flaws in the risk reward system, this whole thing intrinsically fucks. Once we've collected all the relics and placed them in their respective standing stones, we unlock a portal that takes us to the boss of Morningvale, the Lady of Ascension. Wrath has three boss fights, each one at the end of their corresponding hub worlds, and each one asks us to utilize the power gate abilities we find in each hub. So here, the Lady of Ascension fight has us flying upwards to different levels of the arena as she herself floats upward. It's a pretty straightforward fight where we need to dodge her attacks or reflect them with a shield power-up and dump all the ammo we've got in her direction. After dealing enough damage, we need to shoot her in the face... And then that's it. Morning Veil is complete, and there's a portal to take us to our next hub. Okay, so Morning Veil has done a lot of heavy lifting in regards to world building and introductions to gameplay. We've seen the lion's share of enemies, most of the arsenal, and quite a few of the artifacts. By rights, Morning Veil ought to be the hub that should take us the longest as we get our bearings. We understand how deep and wide these levels are, and also understand what is asked of us as we try to cleanse the evil of these lands once and for all. But as we're about to see... Warning Veil is only the tip of the ginormous iceberg that is Wrath, and believe you me, kids, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Right off the bat, there are a number of changes that we will notice. For starters, remember that gothic aesthetic of Morning Veil? Yeah, that is pretty much gone. The Eventide Wastes have this fantasy desert vibe going for them, with rolling sand dunes, crystal formations, ancient ruins carved with detailed figures, and inscrutable magic-based technology. Going from gothic slash Lovecraft to fantasy isn't a bad thing. It helps pace out the game and keep things fresh. Entering the wastes, I was awestruck by the quiet, gentle atmosphere and architecture, the glittering skybox full of stars, and... <clears throat> oh. The ability to fall to my death. Yep, my lovin' endorsed this. No problems with that. This is a little weird. Morning Veil didn't have any life-threatening aspects to its hub, but here, if we're not careful with our air dashing, it is too easy to slip off the side of the sandy cliffs and tumble down into the cosmos. In fact, the sand here has these awkwardly slippery properties that can and will cause you to fall off the edge if you're running too fast up a slope and not paying attention to your own movement. How do you slip on sand? That makes no sense. The standing stones no longer act as a compass for directions toward whichever portal we want to enter next. Instead, we'll have to remember our landmarks and surroundings to help keep us on track. In theory, this is fine, and it could work if done right. But sometimes, it's really easy for me to get lost in simple environments. So I can't help but admit that I was a little bit let down that they stopped using this mechanic of the environmental compass. Luckily, I could navigate the hub without much trouble. <laughs> So it's not all bad. The Eventide Wastes are divided into another five maps. The Crystal Dunes, the Burrows, Shadow Pantheon, the Twilight Altars, and the Watchtower. We also get two new weapons on this hub, such as the Lance and the Crystallizer. There's also a couple of new enemies like the Keeper and the Prowler. No, not that Prowler. No, not him either? Okay, that's just a Plymouth Prowler car. What does that have to do with the video? Genuinely speaking, I liked both of the new enemies. They provide some fantastic new combat strategies and variety. Prowlers generally hang out by themselves and will announce their presence with a brief chittering noise before they fucking vanish, and then you won't see them again until they reappear to fuck you up like they're the goddamn predator, prepared to strike and take a lot of HP from you. 
despite that, I do like these guys a lot. My preferred strategy was to immediately stand still the moment I heard one. Shotgun ready and waiting. Poised like Muldoon in Jurassic Park, but only this time, when the clever girls tried to pounce, I was ready. Man, I would have survived in Jurassic Park if I was in the movie. Our new weapons here are both versatile and exceedingly welcome. The Lance is a railgun sub, and acts exactly how you think it acts. Think the railgun from Quake 2. Two shots to most higher tier enemies to kill them, one shot to anything lower than a heretic. The Lance is a lifesaver, but its ammo counter is much smaller than other weapons. It comes out somewhere around 25 plasma charges, and replenishment is difficult to come across. I tried out the Lance's secondary attack only one time. Yep, you heard me right. One. Single. Individual. Never again. Not more than two. Once in my life. Only one time. It pops up a shield around your weapon which reflects projectiles back towards other enemies. However, the shield drains two charges per projectile deflected. You know, I probably would have loved to use this mechanic more, but when the ammo is this scarce, that's just not worth it. Meanwhile, the Crystallizer is a double-edged sword. Its primary fire launches a steady stream of purple energy that will reflect outward to catch enemies. This shreds lower tier enemies in seconds and is great for clearing rooms. It is crack levels of good. But one of the downsides is that you can never really tell how effective this was against higher tier enemies. Every time I poured a steady stream of energy into my enemies, I was always kind of unaware of whether or not I was doing any significant damage until I finally jibbed them. The secondary fire is a single, charged up shot that you have to hold down for a few seconds, charging up as much as 50 energy before releasing. It will transform whatever enemy it strikes into a crystal statue, effectively one-shotting them. Just imagine being one of these enemies and then presumably having to live out the rest of your life as a crystal statue. Now that would suck. What? I've got nothing else to add, I just wanted to throw that thought into the video somewhere. Here is where the game's cryptic nature worked both against it and, well, also myself. Wrath sometimes relies on gamer experience and willingness to experiment to convey information about weapons that the game doesn't express directly. I had to experiment with the Blade of Ruination to truly understand how powerful that secondary strike was, but I didn't have any inclination to experiment with the Crystallizer's secondary fire. After all, if I've turned an enemy into pure crystal, they're dead and I no longer have to worry about shooting at them anymore, right? Turns out wrong. Big wrong. One of the key advantages to the crystal transmutation is that, once you've crystallized an enemy, you can then fire the primary energy stream at the statue to refract your beam into several powerful beams around the area, potentially hitting multiple targets around you. Where the primary fire will chain between maybe one or two enemies, this method can strike as many as five or, hell, even ten at once. But the game never offered me that solution nor did it once hint at it. Now, dear viewer, I hear you saying and writing in the comments, Ruby Ranger, how the hell do you know? Reading the achievements. Yep, you can get an achievement for hitting a certain number of enemies with one refracted beam of energy. You see how I can kind of overlook that or not know that? It's this cryptic, sort of convoluted thought process that takes hold slowly, but surely, here within the Eventide Wastes. Now, as a big Indiana Jones fan, and as a fan of Hexen, I don't care what Civi-11 says, Hexen is goaded and phantom tax on God. No cap. For real, for real. Plus skill issue. Wait, when the hell did I write this? Uh, can we cut this part out, please? There were several aspects of the Wastes that spoke to me. Statues and carvings that take inspiration from Zoroastrianism and Mesoamerican cultures. Expansive maps that have an added emphasis on verticality and ancient technology which operate on a mixture of crystals and mechanics. The Eventide Ways certainly do not lack for any amount of imagination or beauty in their environments. I've already mentioned my love of Dr. Jones, but once upon a time, I took an archaeology course in college. Yes, kids, I am swimming in student debt. But anyhow, since then, I've collected and studied multiple texts on ancient history, and I've always wanted to visit sites of significant historical importance. Speaking of historical importance, I also took a class about Krakiology and learned how the government created and popularized it in the 80s. It gave me more of an understanding about history- What the- wait, what the fuck is this? Here in the wastes, from start to finish, this journey feels like stepping into the home of some long dead race. Not just the victim of whatever cosmic war is going on in the background of Wrath's story but something akin to an elder culture that dared to look upwards towards the stars without blinking, pushing themselves in divine ways to reach the heavens. When you couple this 
with Holschultz's excellent atmospheric soundtrack, there is a genuine, palpable sense of walking through a decaying world, a holy place that no one should trespass, where nothing good has walked on these grounds for a very, very long time. And I absolutely loved this. But for all the moments of splendor, this sensation only carries the even tight wastes for so long before the tedium starts to set in. From the very first map that I entered, which was the Crystal Dunes, Wrath very quickly appears to be taking on a new direction with the design elements. Where Morning Veil's maps felt like there was an organic linearity to them and their size, these maps here feel overcomplicated and directionless by comparison. Backtracking to an extent that I couldn't figure out if I was moving forward or backward after certain set pieces, vertically built architecture with multiple levels that contains multiple leaps across said levels, where missing a jump means falling down so far that it could sometimes take around five minutes of meandering just to return to that spot and try the leap again? Hell, I feel like I want to jump down after this. And there were ambushes so cruel that it makes the erection crusher of Death Kings of the Dark Citadel look like Chex Quest, or Nerf Arena Blast, or Laser Arena. Or Super 3D Noah's... I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, you get the fucking point. Believe me, Death Kings changes a person. I think the best example of this is the Burrows. The Burrows is... The Burrows is so big that it feels overwhelming to just try and describe it. You could put a million elephants in it. According to my footage, it took me over an hour and a half to navigate this map. Like, holy shit, dude, I could have watched Men in Black 2. This is partially due to the size of the goddamn thing, and also partially due to the backtracking I faced in just trying to figure out where I needed to go, because the signposting here did not feel like it was leading me in any particular path. The sheer scope of this map is truly a testament to the talent and the imagination of the developers here, and yet it also suggests a massive problem in trying to build these large open spaces, such as an oasis surrounded by crystals, a monolithic structure surrounded by smaller interconnected caves, and an underground temple, which leads to a passageway where I discovered the crystallizer on my playthrough. Then, somehow, an open court full of multiple ambushes and trials to retrieve the relic of the map. The devs overreached with their ambition and made something not quite entertaining, but impossible to stop playing. If it feels like I'm downplaying all of this a little bit, that's because I genuinely do not want to go back and revisit every little detail of this map, due to how exhausting it was. I mean, I want to go back and rewatch Men in Black 2 after all. I don't have time for this shit. Jokes aside, there were so many fucking monsters. Like every single corner, there was another group of five monsters that needed attending to. At least one of them, a heretic or an oppressor, followed by a pair of widows jump scaring me as I walked down the hall, or an executioner plowing through a wall as I picked off a couple of fallen. Grabbing the yellow key scored an oppressor teleporting in just to vaporize me with its slag cannons. I swear to God, you cannot pick up anything important in this game or this hub without an ambush. I wanted to jump out of a window because of this. Look here at the end of the map. Look at this chaos. We've got the keeper using its shields while multiple projectiles are coming my way. See this? This is what your last seconds on Earth feels like. Did I mention that this is medium difficulty, kids? MEDIUM! Morning Vale didn't feel like there would be such an escalation to this extent. Now, I don't mind when games are big, sometimes size always matters, kids, but I mind when they're exhausting. Granted, I'll tell you this, kids, this certainly felt like an odyssey. A truly epic journey through the eventide wastes, discovering new areas so impressive in scale and wonder that I felt my interest return once more. But then, after another long series of combat encounters, and ambushes, and jump scares, and shooting, 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 surviving, surviving, bathroom break, and also surviving. I was just so tired of playing this. I don't like feeling fatigued by the games I play. A rush of adrenaline slowly petering away is one thing, but to have my entire body go numb as though I've been working out for the past hour and a half with still no end in sight to just one map that is a problem. A problem I can't help but acknowledge. And unfortunately, even Tide Wastes has this problem. Luckily, all things come to an end as we eventually make our way to this hub's boss, the Lord of the Astral Plane. So this hub's power gate ability provides the outlander to see 
unseen things. Invisible staircases and walls and switches and pillars, stuff like that. Whenever we cross the gate that allows us to see these objects, we can also interact with them, as though we're temporarily able to exist on their plane of reality. Some really artsy shit. So when we first meet the Lord of the Astral Plane, we can't harm him. Instead, we have to use the gate's power to climb a series of ruins to deactivate three switches. The Lord, meanwhile, is attacking us as this happens, so we're gonna have to be nimble. Once these three switches are, um, switched, we're teleported to an arena on top of a high tower where we finally get to face the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. This is a lot tougher than the fight with the Lady of Ascension, as the Lord has an energy beam attack similar to the Crystallizer, and there's a group of crystal statues all around the arena that he can bounce attacks off of to hit us with. He does so much fucking damage. The key here is to shatter the crystal statues and use the gate in the center of the arena to create pillars around you for extra cover. Either that, or use a shield artifact to keep yourself safe. From there, it's just a matter of unloading your powerful weapons as quickly as possible, avoiding shots and diving for cover. Stick with it, and he'll eventually dissolve into the ether, and we get the portal to our next hub. Okay, so with the Eventide Wastes, we're seeing Wrath's design slowly start evolving. Everything is getting bigger, the combat more intense, and the scope expanding. Morningvale set us up on a journey to cleanse this world of whatever plague had infected it, maybe even revive it once we defeated these corrupted guardians. But where our guide, the Shepherd, lamented the loss of the people in Morningvale, here he seems to almost sneer at the former residents of the Wastes, going so far as to mock them at one point. It's a strange tonal shift, and one I don't know how to feel about. If I didn't properly convey just how big and exhausting the Eventide Wastes are, then I'm not 100% sure I'm going to truly do justice to this next hub. I mean, even dosing on crack isn't this hard on someone. But our final destination is so fucking massive that it might as well be its own game. So massive that it's as big as an elephant. Alright, what the hell is going on here? I don't remember writing any of this down. Did someone mess up my script or something? Hey, Ruby Ranger. I EDC? W what are you doing here? I hate to barge in like this, but you've probably noticed something off about your script. Oh, yeah. No shit, Sherlock. The truth is that this is your original script. Nothing about it has changed. What the fuck are you talking about? I think I would know my own script. Do you? I mean, who do you think is writing this script in dialogue right now? Me. Right? Wait, no, that... that can't be true. Y no. You're lying! That's right, Ruby Ranger. You are me, and I am... You. EDC, what the hell did you do? This is now my YouTube channel, bitch. I could use your revenue money to buy more crack to supply my demand. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now you have my annoying voice. So suck it. That makes no goddamn sense. No. What the hell? Oh. It was just a dream. Uh. <coughs> Thank God my voice is back to normal. Immediately upon entering the wretched domain, we are in for a visual feast. Holy fuck. In what I can only describe as one of the most impressive visions of hell that I have ever seen in an FPS game after Doom Eternal, the world of the Wretched Domain is rife with cyclopean corpses, brutalist machinery, bones and blood, and, stunningly, gigantic twisting vines with thorns and the impressions of roses. Meat, machines, and mayhem are the words of the day here, younglings, and no matter which of the five oppressive maps we choose to dive into first, we're going to be submerged into the most alien of the three hubs. Our level list is Boundary of the Living, The Blood Pits, The Rending Chambers, Crucible of Souls, and The Red Throne. 
all map names that no doubt have John Romero grinning with boyish glee. There are two new enemies introduced here, the Brute and the Symbol, and we at last receive the final addition to our arsenal, the Mace of Devastation. So, I have to be blunt, while I love the tight design of Morning Vale, and I appreciate the visual aesthetics of the Wastes, the Wretched Domain is, easily, hands down, without a fucking doubt, my favorite hub and what I believe to be the most memorable part of Wrath. Holy fucking shit. Younglings? Younglings, look at this! I can't tell if this hub is built inside of a giant carcass, or around a giant carcass, or what, and I don't really care because this is metal as hell. We've got booby traps and ambushes, skulls and eldritch machines, red skyboxes with massive horns and vines reaching upwards towards the uncaring heavens. I called these maps oppressive, and that is the actual best word to describe everything we experience in the wretched domain. A sensation of oppression, of being held down by the weight of this world and the, the monsters encroaching on us, of fighting to not just hold our position, but to remain upright while doing so. From a visual standpoint, this is the best work in the game, hands down. It could be because it feels more like a natural progression for Morning Vale than the Wastes did. If we compare them side by side, we can see the evolution of the color schemes. The grays and whites and crimson accents versus the harsh blacks and metallic stone awash in every shade of red imaginable, lighter and darker. The aesthetic departure we experienced with the Wastes was interesting, possibly even necessary from a progression standpoint, but the wretched domain feels like Morning Vale's hell. You pick up what I'm putting down? Morning Vale had the Priory and the gardens and the swamps, the wretched domain is surgically carved stone and hellish engines and encroaching vines. Where I felt my attention waning at times with the wastes, man, oh man, was I sucked right back into the thick of things in this hub. And yet, somehow, some fucking how, this hub features the largest, the longest, and the most exhausting levels we will see in the entire game. Which is why the addition of the Mace of Devastation is so, so welcome. This weapon is by far the best dark fantasy BFG since the Wraith Verge. Maybe even better. At first glance, there's nothing to sneeze at. It's just a mace, so it's a bit of a hoary endeavor to just get up close and personal and swing away and hope for the best, but hey, it worked for your mother, so why not here? Was that too big of a stretch? Okay, scratch that, let's move on. So despite the mace's lack of reach, its impact is thundering and it'll finish off any opponent very quickly. <laughs> okay, fuck's sake, that fits too. I gotta keep that one. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Uh, my mom, not your mom. She loves that shit. Now, unlike the rest of the weapons at our fingertips, the mace does not have a traditional secondary fire. Instead, as we kill enemies, they will leave behind souls that the mace will absorb. Once we've absorbed 10 souls, the mace will charge up and start to quake and quiver. Giggity. And then we can unleash a bevy of explosive skulls that will home in on nearby enemies. Each skull's blast radius is not only impressive, but can and will kill everything minus bosses in one hit. What's beautiful about this attack is that we don't have to wait until we have all 10 souls stacked up to be able to use this attack. We can use it at any time. So if we're caught in a bad spot, need to kill something hefty in front of us real quick, here's your exit strategy. The maze is deadly, destructive, and damn near the best weapon Wrath has to offer. Okay, now let's talk about the new enemies. Here's the Brute. I hate him. Where I felt like I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any creature in Wrath using the Blade of Ruination, including the Executioners, the Brutes felt too hefty for me to confidently approach with my wrist blade. Taking in the sight of one of these absurdly large beefcakes thundering towards you, all while the mortar strapped to their back is launching fireballs in your direction, that's just... <laughs> How about new? I did, eventually, throw caution to the wind and tried out the mace's effectiveness on the brutes, which turned out to work really well in my favor, but boy oh boy did it really feel like a bad idea every time I attempted it. Meanwhile, on the other hand, there's the symbol. I love these guys. Just look at them. Floating around with their Cthulhu-esque tentacles and their stone yokes bound to their bodies, quite frankly one of the best Lovecraft-inspired enemy designs that I have ever seen. First time I saw one of these descend from the ceiling towards me, I shouted, KITTY! And I only referred to them as Kitty for the rest of my game. Look at this. This is Kitty. This is perfection. Meow. So, Kitty, sorry, the symbol, floats around, usually in packs of three or four, lazily tossing energy balls in your direction, usually attempting to catch you in the crossfire. I admit I had a few times where I got overconfident in my ability to dodge them, but I was so focused on engaging with these beautiful beasts that I didn't really care. Lastly, we have our third and final power gate ability in the form of the Sigil of Wrath. Cross this gate and temporarily gain what can only be described as a berserk power-up. You can only use melee weapons in this state, enemies go down in one hit, and while we're berserked, we will be able to see weaknesses in the environment around us. This will allow us 
us to break down walls or oversized chains to access either new areas or drag these areas down to us. Okay, so I've ladled a lot of praise under this part of the game. But one thing that I have to absolutely stress is that more than either of the previous two hubs we've experienced, the wretched domain is going to suck big old donkey dong. If it hasn't sunk in that using infinite saves versus soul tethers is the way to go, then reaching this point in the game will be the convincing factor. Each of these maps took me well over an hour. The Crucible of Souls alone was a 90 minute experience, and the absolute magnitude of monsters surrounding you at any point is teeth grinding to where I felt my determination to finish the game waning. I could really point to any of these maps as an example of how egregious the map design has become at this point, swollen to excess and rife with unrestrained pathmaking. But the Red Throne stands out as the biggest slog in the entirety of Wrath. I don't even know where to begin with this one. To call it a journey, or even an odyssey, is quite possibly one of the biggest understatements ever made about anything related to first-person shooters. First off, I have to pause to point out that Hull Schultz's ominous, atmospheric score has taken on a decidedly sinister tone. That's apparent from the first few notes that hit our ears as we enter the Red Throne. starts outside, in a valley of unnaturally carved stone, forcing our way into what can only be described as a cross between a castle and a factory. A facile? Cactory? Sliding down a chute filled with blood as our entrance, for most of this map will be on the lower levels of the fortress, with numerous enemies either floating above or taking pot shots from the upper level, while we are trying desperately to dodge and decimate everything on the same floor that we're on. I kept forgetting to look at how many enemies were in this map, like 400? 500? Would you say? 10 million? There is, at one point, a parade of maybe 20 widows just fucking barreling straight towards us in one of the most obvious middle fingers from a developer I have ever seen. And this is all just the outer areas of the fortress. Once we make our way to the inner area at last, we'll have to break some stone chains to gain access to the generator in the deepest core of the map, where we must surmount what I can only call the meanest cruelest, most damning ambush in the whole of this game. Suspended over a pit of eternal darkness, we are assaulted from multiple tiers above by a devastating number of flying enemies and monsters, perched on ledges, all of them tossing projectiles in our direction. There's, I don't know, maybe a possibility of surviving this encounter without having to use one of the shield artifacts in order to do so, but I couldn't do it. There was no amount of dodging or utilizing of cover to be able to get past this point, so I said, and activated every shield I had one after the other to cover my soft pink ass and make it through. The Red Throne is not terribly designed. I, I don't think it is. I think it is over-designed. Definitely too big, certainly too cruel, and overwhelmingly tiring to play through in one sitting. The rest of the wretched domain, for the most part, suffers from a similar ideology. Huge maps that are even more expansive and directionless than they were in the wastes. Concussive amounts of monsters to marathon through, and enough ambushes to make anyone throw their hands up in frustration, as yet another monster pops out from around a corner to shank you and send you back 20 minutes to your last soul tether. And yet, somehow... All of this is balanced out with the game's best design aesthetics. Visually astounding sights lie at every turn. Each map is gorgeously constructed and painted in ways that will both haunt me and seduce me back into playing the game. I've already started a second playthrough of Wrath, as I've mentioned, and I'm very much looking forward to returning to the Wretched Domain, if only to just take in these sights once more at my own pace, understanding better what I'm in for, and yes, using infinite saves so I can back out whenever I'd like to. So at the end of all this madness, we now face down our final boss, the Dreadful One. Up until this point, the Shepherd has been guiding us through our journey and dropping hints about how the one who has been trapped needs us to destroy the Guardians who have corrupted the lands, and then we can free it. Well, it turns out that the Great One was the Shepherd this entire time, possibly forced into this more graceful form by the Guardians that we had just killed, and now he regains his true form as the Dreadful One, 
absorbing powers from these pained corpses and dropping volleys of monsters to keep us at bay. It's kind of a neat twist in that there's hints dropped several times throughout the game. You'll notice the shepherd become more snarky and condescending. We'll see images and iconography reflecting his image throughout the wastes and the wretched domain, and so when he transmogrifies into the ultimate eldritch villain at the end of it, well, can't say we didn't get some kind of warning. This fight is a little trickier than the previous bosses. First off, we can't harm the Dreadful One directly until we've destroyed the corpses that he's drawing energy from. And to do that, we have to wait until each corpse has manifested a ball of energy that the Dreadful One will slowly meander over to feed off of. Once we've popped all of those like inconvenient butt acne, we can turn our attention to the Dreadful One while nimbly dodging the hordes he's still summoning for help. Time, patience, and a whole lot of ammunition will see the day through, and voila, wrath is complete. I have to say, I do like the image here of the Outlander leaving the Isle of the Dead exactly the way he arrived, in a coffin on a boat. It's kind of poetic, but at the same time, the transition from the fight to this cutscene was kind of jarring. Like, here we are doing battle with a mutated god and suddenly we're just floating away across the Sea of the Dead. Nothing in between, just that's all folks. It doesn't feel very satisfactory to be tossed from the final boss fight directly into the credits, but that seems to be about par for the course with this game. Wrath, Eon of Ruin, does a lot of things right. It also has a lot of flaws. But mostly, it doesn't feel like it is very consistent with its design. Sure, each hub has five super massive maps, each hub slowly growing larger and larger in both scale and concept, but where you would think the gameplay experience would feel consistent even across these diverse environments, Wrath instead flails about, unable to maintain what I feel is a cohesive experience. Each hub is so different, so unique in their own experience, that they all feel like they ought to be separate games. Concepts and gameplay, introduced in the first hub, carry over into the second and third hubs, but the same execution does not. Little inconsistencies abound that stack and stack until by the end of Wrath, it really does feel like we are not playing the same game that we first started back in the tutorial. What if I told you there was a reason for that? What if I told you that Jeremiah Fox really only completed work on about a third of this game. So recently, as I was prepping research for this video, I stumbled across a post in the Steam community page for Wrath, talking about how Fox had left the project all the way back in 2020 and hadn't had anything to do with the full release outside of providing technical assistance. There was a quoted forum post made by Fox in January of 2021, stating that he had stepped away from development on the game, that the game was in a good place, and that he was actually looking forward to the full release. Fast forward to March of 2024, and here's Civi dropping a video called 3D Realms Vibe Check, which is an excellent video that you should go watch if you haven't already. And here in this video, Civi talks about Wrath. He gives his thoughts on the game, how he thinks it's just kind of fine and is lukewarm on it. But to my everlasting surprise, there's Fox leaving a comment on the video. Here, Fox states that he made most of the design decisions for Wrath in addition to doing the majority of the art and sound. However, he only worked on a texture set or two for the Wastes and the Wretched Domain, and that someone else worked on the rest. For Fox, the Symbol and the Lance were his final contributions to the game before he ended his partnership with 3D Realms in 2020. In this comment, he says he can take a lot of blame for Wrath's problems, but also stated, quote, I can rightly place the blame for Wrath's failure on certain 3D Realms leadership. Damn. Now, kids, before we continue this section of the video any further, I'm not out here trying to start shit or stir up controversy for either Jeremiah Fox or for 3D Realms, but these are comments made on public forums, so they are pieces of information we should take into consideration when talking about this game. And when I interviewed Fox, I did, in fact, ask him about his contribution to Wrath's design, asking if he had had much influence on the design of Hubs 2 and 3, or if the majority of his work was done in the first hub. He responded, by the end of pre-production, virtually the entire game, aside from a couple weapons, enemies, and artifacts, had been planned and documented. At a minimum, each level had a name, a description, playtime, sequence order, POIs, introductions of new elements, weapons, enemies, artifacts, mechanics, etc., mood boards, and other details. Some of the Hub 2 and 3 levels went into production before some of the Hub 1 levels. Most of the assets I produced are found in Hub 1, since that had almost exclusive focus once the decision to go into early access had been made. I parted ways when the last Hub 1 level, the Hollow, was in development. It was in Blockout and Combat Pass at the time. I had put more work into the Crystal Dunes, then called the Flooded Dunes, than the Hollow. So what I gather from this is that Fox did, in fact, 
have ideas and input on the totality of Wrath, if not the full direction of where the game was going. But most of his actual direct work went into the first hub, which is what was seen in the initial early access release. Now imagine this. You've been working on developing this idea for the better part of seven years. You've streamlined the vision down and cut all the fat, but now your publisher asks you to make the game three times as big and restore a lot of the content you've already removed. The scope of your game has just tripled, and you're given the monumental task of wrangling that. Instead of continuing forward with this, your prize, your baby, you instead decide to walk away from it all and leave it in the hands of the team assembled to bring your dream to life. Why would Jeremiah Fox do that? Well, I didn't ask. I also didn't feel like it would be my place to ask that. It's hard not to decipher that there's been some friction at play behind the scenes, and whatever ramifications there might be from being frank about such things just doesn't feel necessary to get into. When I asked Fox if he would answer some questions for me, I specifically addressed avoiding potential drama, and he agreed to answering written questions in order to respond to them with more thought and tact. But this, to me, explains why Wrath feels like such a disjointed experience why Morning Vale feels so tight in focus, and why the Wastes and the Wretched Domain feel more meandering and out of focus. It's because the core concepts and design work by the person whose singular vision this was, was no longer at the helm for the development of the latter two hubs, and instead, that vision was translated by the rest of the team at Slipgate Ironworks into what we have now. Now, look, I don't want to disparage the devs behind the experience of Wrath. Slipgate Ironworks has some very clearly talented people who worked in this game. I mean, holy fuck, just look at the wretched domain. Even the Eventide Waste, which really didn't work for me as a whole, still had so much going for it. Some excellent executions. Whether or not Wrath follows the sole focus design document of Jeremiah Fox does not determine the overall quality of the game, but it does explain why, after a certain point, it feels like I'm playing something different. I wanted to try and recreate this experience to see if I could produce a video that captured what it's like to play Wrath. Did you kids notice anything unusual about this video? Anything feel off during a couple of the chapters? What if I told you that I had two of my fellow YouTubers rewrite two chapters of my script for this video? That's right! I had Elephants Doing Crack rewrite the section on the Eventide Wastes, and High Functioning Medium rewrote the section on the Wretched Domain. Both of those chapters contain my thoughts, my words, my opinions on those sections of the game, but I invited the two of them to rework the flow of the chapters and to add whatever content they wanted, and to even reword my own thoughts. I even tried to capture their cadence and tonality while reading those parts of the script. And it was hard. The whole thing felt really fucking weird. I had this idea, and I thought, if we pull this off, it'll make for a really great thought experiment. But when I sent away my draft of the script for them to look over and rewrite, I got really nervous. I got possessive. It hit me that I was giving away my own words to someone to change my work into something more like theirs, and that I was going to commit to putting that in my video. To say that I was intimidated was an understatement. It felt more artistically vulnerable than I've ever felt before. Jeremiah Fox quit his job. He moved to the Keys. He lived out of his car, all in the pursuit of fulfilling the goal of bringing Wrath to life. 3D Realms approached him to fund development and act as publisher. Everything was coming up Millhouse. And yet, in October of 2020, as the size and scope of Wrath was expanded, Jeremiah Fox looked ahead to the potentiality of how this game would turn out given these new marching orders, and he excused himself from his own project. And that is a decision I couldn't possibly imagine making. In my final question to Fox, I asked if seeing Wrath in 1.0 was bittersweet, and if he had fully divorced his emotions from the project. It is bittersweet, yes. I'm not divorced from Wrath, but my attachment and emotions toward it are more properly ordered and regulated. Although I have my regrets, I'm grateful for the experience and opportunity. I learn by doing, and Wrath was a boot camp that encompassed most domains of game dev. Whether mistakes, failures, or successes, there is always something to learn from them. And what I learned is invaluable. I'm far more prepared, experienced, and capable now than when I began, and I'm taking all that with me as I move forward to the next project, which will, in turn, provide its own challenges, lessons, and opportunities for me to grow and improve. So yes, it's bittersweet, but more sweet than bitter. And at this point, we answer the question. Yes, Wrath is the modern Daikatana. Both games had their share of development woes, although both were received far differently on release. Both games were the product of a singular vision, although the creators of both games had much different input on their development cycles. 
uh, where Jeremiah Fox left Wrath only a year into early access, John Romero would stay with Daikatana for the entire development, although his dev team changed so much over that course of time that Romero was one of only two developers who worked on that project from beginning to end. And both games had their pressures and stressors from publishers, in each case dictating the direction of development. While Wrath and Daikatana do have their differences, they are, uh, I believe, for better or for worse, two sides of the same coin. Two cautionary tales for developers and creators. Hopefully for publishers, too. But calling Wrath the modern Daikatana shouldn't disparage the game. It shouldn't imply that it has failed, or that it is bad, or that it is anything less than an achievement in scope that I have never seen before. There were moments that had me locked in and focused and sweating pure adrenaline. Moments that made me wonder how a game like this could even be conceived. And this was spread across the whole of Wrath, not just the content that Jeremiah Fox worked on. Wrath, for all its flaws and setbacks, is the work of many talented developers. And even though I have my criticisms, I do take my hat off in respect of their work. And I hope that that's seen and felt. Wrath, Eon of Ruin, is a massive, bold game that aims for the throat but misses the mark here and there. When it lands on its feet, it lands on all fours, running like an apex predator, but too often does it get in its own way. The game is too large to feel exhilarating when played at length, and the gameplay is too frustrating at times to feel satisfying. The mechanics work infrequently, and yet... Every now and again, they remind you how invigorating and aggressive retro shooters can be. The game as a whole is inviting, worth playing, and is breathtaking in doses, but it must be approached with the understanding that this isn't the kind of shooter you should play for lengthy periods, nor is it one that's always going to feel satisfying to play. That said, Wrath, Eon of Ruin contains some of the best aspects of 90 shooters, also some of the worst, and ultimately rates a 7.5 out of 10. Ironically, the same score that I once gave to Daikatana. And that's all that I've got for this one, kids. Thank you so much for joining me on another lengthy video. A <laughs> uh, quick reminder to anyone who enjoyed this, if you see it and you like it, it helps me immensely when you like the video and that you share it, whether on Twitter or other social media sources. And for those who might be interested in helping support me and then also getting early access to the videos that I put out before they go on YouTube, there's a link to my Patreon in the description of the video. Now, that said, sit up straight, go eat your vegetables, and stay hydrated. I'll see you next time.